So let's kick off this video series with, on CCNA3 Scaling Networks. Uh, with me, Joachim Schäverestad, lecturer in informatics from the University of uh, Skövde. And we're going to start with chapter one of the Cisco material for CCNA3 version 6, which is a local area network design. And even if I did promise you that this course will be thought use in context-based microtraining and a lot of practicals, this is actually a fully theoretical lecture because that is basically how the material starts. So yeah, let's just begin with a quick course overview. And what we're going to explore during this course is basically switching and, uh, and routing in, on, a more, on a more advanced level. So the pro protocols that we will explore is first spanning tree protocol, which is a protocol used to uh, enable loop free layer two networks. We're then going into dynamic trunking protocol, which allows for uh, trunk mode being uh, dynamically set on switches. Then we're going to do uh, VTP, which is called VLAN trunk protocol, which is basically a protocol that allows for automatic VLAN configuration. So you only have to configure your uh, VLANs on one single switch in your domain. Then we're going into inter-VLAN routing and uh, before we move on to ether channel, which is a way to aggregate links. And then we're going to do some HSRP, which is a first hop redundancy protocol that allows for redundant uh, default gateways within the local area network, and then we're going to do basic and advanced dynamic routing with EI, GRP, and OSPF for IPv4 and IPv6. Uh, however, for this lecture, we're going to start with local area network design, and we're going to look a little bit about uh, LAN design considerations, the Cisco hierarchical design model, scalability, and some considerations for selecting switches and routers. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about how to manage devices. We're not going to do a practical, practical on that because since we are at CCNA3 level, I would assume that everyone listening to this material already knows how to connect to and manage Cisco devices. So let's get started on some of the design considerations. And it may go, go without saying and seems to be certain in, in the modern day, but when you build a local area network, it requires you to employ some sort of good planning to meet the present and the future requirements on the network. And what we mean by that is that we have to have a network that is good for the needs of the business today, but we also have to plan for how the business will grow into the future. Because if we are at a business that I don't know, houses like 100 employees, 100 users in our network, then our network, of course, has to be good for, for that. But what are the business goals? Are, is the plan to grow with 10, 500 or 5,000 users in the coming five years? That's something that we have to, to build for so that our network will be able to support a business need not only now, but also in one year or in five years. Uh, and some of the requirements that we're going to explore and talk about is performance. Well, uh, it's one of the most important ones, I guess. How does the network perform? Is it fast enough? Can it support voice over IP? Can it support streaming? Can it support the file sizes that we need and so on and so forth? Next one is manageability. And that is basically, is our network easy enough to manage? And what will happen if the network grows? Will, will it continue to be as manageable as it is today? Security, very important in today's networking and in today's com computing. Is our network built to be secure? Scalability, how is our network built so that it can grow in a smooth and easy way? Uh, purpose, which is sometimes uh, missed when you talk to computer technicians, you always want to have the coolest and the, the best and the fastest, but is it is it purpose specific? Does it match the purpose that we have? Um, I actually have one real life uh, example of this when when we in our lab didn't really buy the the, net, the network equipment that was purpose uh, purpose appropriate for us. We had to have layer layer three switches that could house a number of of VLANs. But it turned out that even if it said that and that it could house like a couple of thousand VLANs, it was a problem with the routing table that only allowed 32 VLANs on each device, and that was an issue. So you really have to get down and dirty and see what is the purpose of the network, what is our requirements, how is the network going to be built to match that, and then what equipment do we need. Uh, redundancy, which sort of goes into, into the security factor, how can we build the network so that 
we have redundant services, redundant links, redundant gear, so that if one router fails, uh, the whole network will not be out of touch. And of course, cost, which is sort of the, the negation of all of the above. We want high performance, high manageability, and so on and so forth, but we, we still need network to be affordable, and how can we achieve that? So moving further into the design consideration, something that you have to know as a network engineer in 2018 and forward is that a modern network has to be able to support different types of data. And this will include file data file which is, or, and email, which is pretty much the traditional network, uh, but also voice and video. Because even if you don't want your users to stream YouTube all days, uh, it's a modern requirement that a network should be able to support uh, video meetings um, and voice over IP and that sort of stuff. Uh, and also an enterprise network is in modern day expected to support all the critical applications that are in the network, support converged network traffic, which is basically be able to support different types of traffic, uh, files, email, voice and video, uh, support diverse business need. Maybe we have one department that has one need and we have another department that has a vastly different need. Uh, and we also want the network to provide some centralized administrative control so that there is one IT department that can control the network from one point. We don't want to have the control of the network distributed around different uh, different departments. Uh, so the, the way that Cisco tries to uh, tries to build a way to shibel this is by building a hier hierarchical design model, which is basically a model for how to design your network in three steps. Uh, and what a, what a model does is that it breaks down the network into different layers and allowing each la layer to implement different functions. So uh, the hierarchical design model is a tree uh, is a tree layer model with a core distribution and access layer, where the core layer is uh, the la layer that connects all the distribution branches and connects the network to the wide area network, like the internet. And the next level is the distribution, area, uh, di distribution layer, which connects access branches and provides access to services. So uh, in, a modern, in, in a common network, you would have a distribution layer that, con that connects to your server park and that connects to your users and that's, that connects to to the core layer, which in turn connects to the internet. And the idea with a distribution layer is to be a high-speed network for internal switching and routing and VLAN routing and, and s stuff like that. And uh, finally, we have the access layer, which basically provides endpoint connection to, to the network. So the access layer is where you, your clients connect to, to the network. Uh, in smaller networks, you may combine the core and distribution layers, and then it's called a collapsed core design. That's a very common question for Cisco tests. Uh, so mo moving on to a brief discussion on how to plan for scalability. Um, and as I said, once designing a network, you have to ensure that it's available and scalable. And scalable would mean that it's easy to make the network grow. It's easy to add more ports on the access layer while necessary. It should be easy to expand the bandwidth out to the internet if necessary and so on and so forth. And some recommendations to follow to ensure a scalable network is use modular devices or clustered devices. And what a modular device is, is basically a device where you can add and remove ports as you please. So if you look at the standard CCNA equipment that I'm sure you've seen in the lab, you, you, you I'm sure you have uh, 2600 switches with tw with 24 ports and that's it but if you if you were to have a modular switch you could just add and remove a switch port so maybe at one point the switch will start having 100 port ports but then as the network grow you can just buy another uh, network interface and put in there and you can have another 100 ports uh, the other way, another way is to use the hierarchical network design so you know in which layer to add functionality. It also allows you to see where in your network the, the bottlenecks are so you know where you have to expand. Uh, you should also use an IP addressing strategy that has room for, uh, for expansion. And what that means is basically, well, if you have 20 users, you, maybe you shouldn't put all of your network in a in a network that only allows for 32 IP addresses because it's it's quite limited. Instead, if you use IPv4, you should subnet your network so that 
there is room for expansion in every part of the network. If you use IPv6, there is an abundance of addresses, so you can just spill in addresses in your network so you know that you have room for, for future expansion without having to redesign your network. Uh, and also, when we're talking about scalability and performance, you should use routers and multilayer switches to limit broadcast domains. And this is more of a performance performance thing, maybe. But as you remember, broadcast, dom broadcast domain uh, is the scope of how many nodes that would receive a broadcast. And of course, you want to limit that because broadcast is network traffic. And if you have a broadcast domain of like 2,000 hosts, then every broadcast message will be sent to every one of those hosts. Uh, and that's going to create an overlay on the network, which is not really, uh, not, not, not really something that we want. So let's move on to planning for redundancy. And to set the stage, you need to understand that in modern network, we expect 100% uptime. Uh, there are service providers that are writing service level agreements for like 99.9% .9 uptime or, or even 100% uptime, where the service provider actually have to pay a fine to... Uh, to the customer if they can't meet that. There is also, uh, I mean, in modern companies, networking is a business critical service. If the network doesn't work, the company can't do any work, meaning that network downtime costs money. Uh, so one of the things that we achieve high uptime is using redundancy. And what redundancy means is that we have multiple things. So if we have redundant web servers, that means that we have two web servers. If we have redundant links, that means that we have several links uh, to reach the same the same path. So if you look at switch one S1 in, in the wiring closet in the image here, and you look at the server farm, you can see that switch one is uh, does have redundant links over switch six and switch two. And that is one way to implement redundancy. Even if one of those links will break, it can still use the, the other, other link and the network will work as expected. Um, something you have to know about using redundant, redundant links is that it can create layer two loops and layer two frames does not have a time to live uh, field. So if you do have a loop at layer two, it will just remain in your network basically forever. And that's a big problem because it's eventually going to break your switches. But fortunately, there is spanning tree protocol that's, that mitigates this problem. And we're going to explore that in a later lesson. Uh, so moving on to the concept of failure domains. Um, and what a failure domain is, is basically the number of hosts that will be affected by uh, by a problem. So when you talk about a failure domain, you, you basically do it scenario based. So looking at the topology here, you can say that, for instance, if switch one breaks, what's the failure domain? And failure domain in this, uh, in this instance will be in terms of end users that are affected. So the failure domain of switch one will be the host one, two and three. And the failure domain of the router here would be the entire network behind. Uh, so it's a good practice to try to limit the size of failure domains um, and also limiting the impact of an error. So one way to, uh, to ensure that, that the severity of switch one breaking here wouldn't be so, so high would be to put another access point on switch two that could supply host one, two, and three with internet ac access even if switch one fails. Um, so that's a little bit on failure domains. It's also a very good uh, tool for troubleshooting. If you know your failure domains and you know what machines that are broken down or unable to contact the internet or whatever, that's a very uh, good indication of where you have to troubleshoot in order to know what, what went wrong and fix the error. Um, so moving on a little bit to the considerations we have to take when selecting gear. So, so let's start with the discussing selecting switches a little bit. And uh, depending on what the network needs, of course, there are several factors that can impact your, uh, your choice of switches. And looking to the terminology that Cisco wants us to use, we should talk about port density, for forward rates, and uh, power over Ethernet support and need for level 3 functionality. So with port density, we basically mean how many ports there are on the switch and how the number can be increased. And actually, port density may be a bigger issue than you think, or maybe a bigger consideration, because because uh, in, in a server park or in a networking closet, we will have a limited number of rack space. 
and we may need to be able to hold as many ports as possible in that rack space. So uh, some considerations are do we need fixed ports or do we need modular switches that we can expand when we need to? Do we need stackable switches? Uh, stuff like that. Basically port density is about how many ports uh, do we need and in what way do we want them to be presented to the network modular or uh, fixed. Uh, forward, forwarding rates, and that is basically about how much data the switch can, can shuffle. And here you should note that you need to consider the internal forwarding rate in the switch as well as the port speed. Uh, so uh, to exemplify this, say that you have a 48 port switch with gigabit ports. You, you easily want to think that that switch can handle 48 gigabytes of of traffic, but that's not always the true because within the switch there is something called the backplane, namely how much data the switch can forward internally. So if you have a 48 port switch but you with gigabit ports but you only have a backplane of 10 gigabits then the switch will still only be able to forward uh, 10 gigabit bits of data uh, at the same time and this is this is one of the things that often different between differ between switches in different price ranges. So if you see 248 a port switch with gigabit ports where one is 300 euro and the other one is 3,000 euro. One of the things to look at is the forwarding rate, rate of the two switches. And do not forget to look at the internal forwarding rate so that you really get the bandwidth that you expect. Uh, next is power over Ethernet support, uh, and especially on the access level, ha level having power over Ethernet is quite common. Uh, power over Ethernet is a way to support uh, a power supply to to end devices. So, uh, in some cases, you can uh, support power to IP phones, access points, and more using power over Ethernet, and that makes sure that you don't have to provide external power outlets for those devices. Instead, you can just let the power be supplied over the Ethernet cable, and that uh, that makes for less uh, less cables. Uh, basically and of course if you expect to have uh, devices powered with power over ethernet then you need to have power over ethernet support in in your network uh, in this case you should know that if you have power over ethernet devices connected on the access layer you only need to have the access switches supporting power over ethernet uh, finally of course you need to plan for whether or not to use layer 3 functionality if you want to use the switches uh, and implement routing functionality on the switches. This can be something that's really good as we're going to explore in the later lecture, but especially when you have different VLANs within your network, it can be very efficient to have the switches uh, responsible for the routing uh, between the VLANs. And actually, at least in a smaller modern network, it's quite common that you, that you just use layer three switching instead of routers altogether. So moving on to uh, the small, a small discussion on selecting routers misspelled. So, uh, a router is used to connect networks and forward traffic between networks, limit broadcast domain, and also provide a layer of security as routers can most commonly act as firewall. So, uh, in Cisco terminology, you should know that there are uh, three categories of routers, branch, network edge, and service provider uh, that with different functionality and different performance where service provider routers are the most, the, the coolest ones and the best ones, of course, and you, you can go read about those in, in the Cisco material. But again, as with the switches, when you select routers, you should be aware that you need to consider things like how many interfaces do you need? What kind of functionality do you need? Do you need it to uh, be able to, to take care of VPN tunnels in an efficient way? What type of firewalling do you need? What routing protocols are you going to run? Uh, and stuff like that. So, uh, just a few words on managing devices because that is something that may end up at a Cisco test near you. Uh, and we're going to, and I'm just going to, to say that managing devices is about how you connect to the devices and Traditionally, there's been four different ways where I would guess that one of them uh, at least is deprecated. But when, you, but there is basically two categories of ways, out-of-band and in-band configuration. It's the same for router and switches. Uh, out-of-band configuration is the way that you have to connect to a, a device that is fresh from the box with no configuration. You would connect to it to the console port using a serial uh, serial 
cable. You can also use mod uh, modem to connect to it through the auxiliary port. I've never done it. I don't know about anyone that does it anymore, but it's at least a way that you can dial in to, uh, to the out-of-band router configuration. In-band router configuration means that you're correct connecting to the router over an IP interface uh, using SSH or Telnet. You should, of course, not use Telnet because it's insecure and crappy, uh, but using SSH to, to connect to a router that is uh, reachable through an IP network. So uh, that's it for lesson one in CC CCNA 3 version 6 with me, Joachim Shevrestad. If there are any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments field and I will try to answer them as best as I can. Thank you for your attention.